We are here uh, this afternoon of March 1st at 2.15 in the afternoon in March 1st, 2000 with Chief Justice uh, Margaret H. Marshall uh, interviewing uh, about her experiences as a judge uh, in the court system of Massachusetts and as the first woman Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court. So Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, if you could, I would like some introductory information uh, to ask you uh, what year you were appointed to the bench and uh, to what court you were appointed and introductory information. I was first appointed to the Supreme Judicial Court and took the oath of office on October the 31st, 1996. That was the first judicial position that I had held. I had been nominated by Governor William F. Weld and confirmed by the Governor's Council. In September 1999, Argio, Governor Argio Paul Cellucci nominated me as Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court and I was sworn in on October 14, 1999. Thank you. When you came on the bench, were there other women on the Supreme Judicial Court? Can you talk about that? In 1996, the Supreme Judicial Court was 304 years old, and in its entire history, only one other woman had served, Justice Ruth Abrams. She met me as a colleague, and she still sits uh, on the bench, and for the period 1996 through 1999, she and I served as the only two women who had served on the Supreme Judicial Court. And then in October 1999, as I was elevated to Chief Justice, uh, Associate Justice Judith Cowan took the oath of office. And at the present time, in March of 2000, three of us sit on the Supreme Judicial Court. Justice Abrams retires on her the anniversary of her 70th birthday in December 2000. Interesting to see what happens then. What did you do before you were a judge? Immediately prior to my appointment as a judge, I was the vice president and general counsel of Harvard University. And before that, I was a partner in the Boston law firm of Choate Hall and Stewart. I graduated from the Yale Law School in June of 1976 and practiced uh, as a trial lawyer in Massachusetts, in Boston from 1976 until 1992 when I was appointed the general counsel of Harvard. Was there an influence of those career activities on your decision to be a judge or on how you think you are a judge now? Neither positions influenced my decision to be a judge. To be perfectly frank, uh, I never anticipated that I would be a judge. It had never occurred to me um, that that was something that I could aspire to, and it certainly didn't occur to me uh, that I would be appointed to the Supreme Judicial Court, which I view as one of the great courts, not only of the nation, but internationally, and that's not just a, a sort of insular point of view. Um, my experience was helpful. Ironically, my experience as, as general counsel of Harvard turned out to be more helpful to me because when I was in the private practice of law, like many attorneys, and especially as you become more senior, you tend to specialize more and more. And as the general counsel at Harvard, I was required to um, be familiar with and provide legal advice with an entirely whole wide range of issues uh, which were attendant to working for a major institution, which also happens to be a major employer in the Commonwealth and major owner of uh, land and buildings in the Commonwealth and elsewhere. So there were areas of law that I had not been exposed to uh, before I went to Harvard, which included criminal law, mm -hmm. Um, employment law, environmental law, um, rate regulation, um, utility regulation, workers' compensation, a whole wide uh, variety of issues, and that turned out to be extraordinarily useful when I came onto the Supreme Judicial Court because, as you know, the docket covers an extremely wide range of legal subjects. And again, 
it was almost an accident of history, first that I moved to Harvard and then that I came to the court. Now, did your decision to become a judge or the thought that you, the, the lack of the thought that you would ever become a judge, was that at all uh, influenced by gender? Is there any role? It was influenced by gender, I think, indirectly in the sense that um, when I was growing up in South Africa in the uh, 40s and 50s, the idea that I would become a professional working woman was the furthest thing from the, my mind. I think there was a clear expectation that um, I would get married and become a mother, very much like most of the women around me. And so the idea of having a long-term career objective uh, really sort of wasn't part of my upbringing. That changed when I came to the United States. When I first began to practice, and particularly, uh, particularly in the wake of the uh, gender bias study and other studies that identified barriers to the advancement of women in the profession, I had worked very hard to encourage um, women to apply for judicial appointment and to support their candidacies through the judicial nominating uh, process and for nomination. I think the reason why I had never thought of becoming a judge was because I loved the practice of law, um, had a very successful practice, and it wasn't a decision not to become a judge. It was simply, uh, it wasn't on my radar screen, although I welcomed the opportunity to assist other women who wanted to become judges. Describe a bit the process of being appointed to the bench. Uh, did you think that gender played any role in that? Gender played a role positively um, in my appointment, I believe, both to the uh, Supreme Judicial Court as an associate justice. Um, I think that Governor William Weld uh, was very aware of the fact that um, there had only been one woman who'd served on the court, and certainly there were women and men in the bar who had urged the governor uh, to reach out and to appoint a more diverse uh, group of justices to the court. And so I certainly think it helped me. Uh, I, in many ways, am the beneficiary of the women who went before me um, in the decades ahead of me who broke down the barriers and who paved the way. Um, Justice Abrams serving all alone on the Supreme Judicial Court for um, close to 20 years before I was appointed must have been a very lonely position. Uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, I know, had the same experience on the United States Supreme Court, and that's echoed by many other women who were the firsts. My generation of women, uh, and I view my generation as a generation of women who graduated in the mid to late 70s, really did have the benefit of the women who had gone before and broken the barriers, as well as the collective benefit of men and women who had uh, urged greater participation of women um, at high levels in the judiciary and the private sector and other aspects of the public sector. And clearly, people in appointment positions were looking uh, to include us in greater numbers. What will be interesting, I think, is as we really round off the phase of history of breaking the barriers and the next generation of women uh, that I see as almost the third generation of women coming behind us where uh, there's now a presumption that women participate equally in all respects, whether we will continue to see uh, the growth of women uh, into the highest offices. And I think the answer to that is yes. So uh, I think gender did play an important role. Second, for my appointment to the, as Chief Justice, again, I think gender was affirmative. Uh, and I've often felt that that is something uh, to be proud of, uh, to uh, be grateful to the women who fought such hard battles beforehand. And I'm talking about not only the ones who succeeded, but all of the men and women who have argued for full gender equality uh, in all aspects of government. And clearly, um, when you are the first, but when there's a growing consensus that it's time there was a first, uh, that works uh, in your benefit. I hope that 
having been the first, that people will look to my position as Chief Justice, learn that women can in fact do well in these positions, and that there will be many talented women and men who follow in my footsteps. I'm, I'm buoyed by your confidence that it's not going to be, we got one, we've done our, our duty, now we can go back to... I don't think that'll happen. I think in some ways uh, women may have an advantage over other uh, representative groups who have also been excluded from participation, I think particularly uh, of African Americans, for example, because we are 51 or 50 percent of the population. And if you look at um, the number of, of women graduates from law schools, it's more or less 50 percent now. And so we have numbers working on our side once the formal barriers have been broken down and once women have been accepted into positions of leadership and authority and power. Um, I think that there are greater challenges for people who are truly members of minority groups because the numbers don't work uh, in your favor. One of the things that um, happened around my appointment to the Supreme Judicial Court is at the same time, although there had only been one woman, Justice Abrams, who had served um, in the court's 300 plus year history, there had never been uh, an African American justice or a person of color. And understandably, I think history worked and Justice Island is now the first African American uh, justice on the Supreme Judicial Court, uh, and I hope that he will be the first of many who follow in his, in his footsteps as well. Mm. You've mentioned the women who came before you and broke down the barriers. Were there any in particular who served as role models or mentors to you once you got on the bench? Certainly Justice Abrams has been a great, both a role model and a mentor. Um, I cannot tell you in how many ways, in different ways, uh, she reached out to lend a helping hand. I should add that all of my colleagues on the Supreme Judicial Court have been most helpful. We are a collegial court, uh, but there was something um, particularly warm about Justice Abrams' welcome of me, and I think I can understand in part why that is the case. Um, she is somebody who I have admired for a long time, uh, I often tease her and say that uh, she is shorter than I am because she had to knock her head against a concrete ceiling and I only had to knock mine against a glass ceiling. And I will certainly miss her upon her retirement mm -hmm. from the court later this year. Wonderful. Any other women who served as role models? Any other judges you want to mention? I can't think of particular people as role models. Um, I do remember appearing before, as a lawyer, appearing before um, a number of truly excellent um, justices in the Superior Court. My practice was primarily uh, in the Superior Court. And I think that there was something uh, enjoyable uh, about appearing before very, very talented uh, judges. Uh, I think in particular of, peop uh, of some of the um, senior judges, but also some who came onto the bench around the time that I was practicing, um, Judge Kathleen White, Judge Barbara Laos, uh, Judge Wendy Gershengorn, Judge Patty Salas, uh, and of course in the federal court, um, Judge Leo Zobel, <coughs> who was appointed as the first federal judge um, in Massachusetts and in the First Circuit had always been an outstanding judge and one that I think many, many lawyers admired for her, her judicial temperament, her intelligence, her talents. It would be wonderful if you could share any observations of uh, interactions within the court uh, throughout your experience as well as since you've been a judge and the Chief Justice uh, that you think were influenced by gender perhaps stories of people being treated in a particular way because of their gender, uh, by attorneys, by judges, by court personnel, uh, interventions you may have seen which you found to be interesting or encouraging? In a way, um, the uh, acting as a justice on the Supreme Judicial Court is a little unusual because 
with rare exceptions, attorneys prepare well before they come before the court. The court tends to take some of the most important cases. And uh, I know certainly when I appeared before the court, I spent a great deal of time preparing for that. There's also something about the, ry the rhythm of appellate argument, um, which is, I think, um, very comfortable for men and women attorneys. You don't have to interrupt as much. Um, the courtroom tends to be quiet. It's a much more controlled environment. The, um, the subject matters are, of course, entirely legal. Um, and I think that women and men um, are equally talented um, in terms of their intelligence about legal issues. And so uh, I think there's, there are very few opportunities to see women either excel above their male colleagues or not to excel or to be treated differently. Uh, it is, of course, the case that oral advocacy, like any other advocacy, um, you have to learn to use the environment in which you are acting as a professional. And I remember um, how I had to learn anew that, generally speaking, women's voices don't carry as well as deeper voices. And so sometimes I had, I have, not only had, I have a difficult time hearing uh, women counsel, and I recognized that sometimes counsel have a difficult time hearing me. And so I have learned to try and project my voice because the Supreme Judicial Court is obviously a very uh, large courtroom, and sound doesn't always carry well, particularly when you've got the noise of traffic or the noise of air conditioners droning in the background. Um, certainly, the kinds of uh, expectations as to who you were in a courtroom that I encountered when I first began to practice, uh, expectation on the part of lots of people that I had to have been a witness uh, or a member of the public and not an attorney, um, occurred fairly frequently and I always thought that was simply because there were so few attorneys, there was nobody being deliberately offensive in many cases. Um, I think would be rare in the Supreme Judicial Court now. We are so accustomed to seeing women advocates uh, that it's sort of taken for granted that somebody could well be uh, an advocate as opposed to uh, simply a member of the public. I do have one continuing observation. We hear, of course, cases on both the criminal side and on the civil side. And without having done any careful check, uh, I would warrant that there are more attorneys who appear uh, in criminal cases, both on behalf of the Commonwealth and on behalf of defendants, than they are on the civil side. It is rare in a criminal case um, that you don't see at least one woman either somewhere on the brief or um, actually arguing or having been trial counsel and sitting at counsel table. And quite often there are cases on the civil side when I still see two men and men entirely on the briefs. And I think that women have probably made more headway on the criminal side, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. But we certainly have excellent uh, counsel on both sides of all genders. Wonderful. I'd like to see how many of them came out of public service, given that they say more women go into public service and that is more criminal see if that's the pipeline. I, I, it could well be because obviously when you leave a district attorney's office or the office of the attorney general, um, you are trained and talented in criminal law and that may be part of the explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect also on the civil side that particularly with large cases that those cases that make their way through trial or a major um, earlier dispositional motion like motion for summary judgment uh, not that many of those cases reach the Supreme Judicial Court, and so we are still seeing the more senior attorneys. But there are more women uh, appealing, and I would certainly say that it's impossible to differentiate on the basis of gender as between their talents or expertise. I heard that you have done something with pictures. I have indeed. You're talking about pictures in my office? Yes. 
I think what you're referring to is, as I was the second woman on the Supreme Judicial, well, let me step back. Uh, on the 13th floor of this courthouse, which is where the Supreme Judicial Court sits, there are pictures of the justices who have preceded me for the past 300 years. We don't have pictures of all of them, but we have a pictures of a great many of them. Justice Abrams, Ruth Abrams, was the only woman who'd served on the court before I joined, and she has never hung her portrait. Uh, these are photographs, and I've been after her for that, and they, it, she will be hung uh, before she leaves. But I was surrounded by pictures of men, and I decided that I would like a few women to join me. And so I obtained photographs with the help of one of the archivists in the Social Law Library and my assistant, Sally Locke. Uh, we obtained photographs of all of the women firsts in each of the trial departments and the appellate courts. Uh, and I had those framed, and they are hanging on my wall. And so I have on my wall uh, Justice Abrams, the first woman on the Supreme Judicial Court, uh, Justice Charlotte Pareda, the first woman on the Appeals Court, Justice uh, Jenny Leutman Ballin, the first woman on the Superior Court, uh, Chief Justice Marilyn Sullivan, the first woman on the Land Court, uh, Justice Beatrice Mullaney, the first woman on the Probate and Family Court, Justice Rebecca Crampton, uh, the first woman on the Juvenile Court, and uh, Justice Emma Schofield, who was the first woman on the District Court and the first woman to serve on the Massachusetts Judiciary. If you go through that list, you will recognize that we were missing one trial department, the Housing uh, Department, and I am pleased to say that later this month, uh, Justice Diana Holland will take her place as one of the first, and I will ha finally have a full complement. And so we now have every court in the Commonwealth has had at least one woman judge. I like to think of that as the 20th century contribution because uh, Justice Emma Schofield joined the bench in the 20th century, and we just managed to get uh, Justice Holland in. Uh, in December 1999. So within one century, we covered every court uh, in the Commonwealth with at least one woman. And I hope that my successor in the year uh, 2099, there will simply be 51% of women in every trial court and every court in the Commonwealth, assuming that we stay at 51%. And that we won't even be having discussions like this. That's wonderful. We, I hope we may take a picture of your wall for our video. Absolutely. Thank you. A moment just about reflections about being the first female Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court. Uh, first, do you have any general reflections on what it is like to be one of the first female Chief Justices in the Commonwealth? Uh, as you've noted, there have been very few, and uh, the total has been six, and currently I believe we have four. I think whenever one is a first, one is conscious of the fact that people uh, watch what you do. Um, I must say, in my experience, um, perhaps it's because um, people only tell you the good news. Um, but I have been uh, delighted with the number of people who have said um, how well they think I handled the confirmation proceeding or what a pleasure it is uh, to see somebody um, as a first you know, occupying this position. I was struck by the number of young women, and I mean young, between the ages of 13 and 20, who wrote to me saying how thrilled they were that I had been nominated as Chief Justice, how perturbed they were at the intensity of the scrutiny of my qualifications when I went through the confirmation process, but how pleased they were that I had been confirmed and they felt in a way that they felt proud about the way I had handled myself. And I must say that meant a great deal to me to recognize that it makes a difference uh, to uh, younger women. I often find myself hesitating when people ask me about role models I must have had role models, but there were so few women. 
that it was very hard to think of people as role models. I think I was part of the generation that really felt the power of sisterhood rather than role models because we really did feel that we were in it together trying to move forward at the goal of gender equality and equality for all people. Um, and so to find that I'm sometimes viewed as a role model feels a little odd, I must say, and makes me feel much older than, of course, any of us ever feel. That's wonderful. Is there anything you want to say about sisterhood now? Do you see a, a current version of sisterhood, either in society at large or among the women on the bench? Yes, I do. Um, I feel very supported uh, and have always felt supported um, by women as I have moved into different phases of my career. I add, of course, that some of the most helpful people to me uh, have been men as well as women. And I think one of the great joys of watching um, women succeed is to realize that it has taken the collective effort of women, but we have been joined in so many ways uh, by men as well who are as committed as we are to equality. Some of my very closest allies have been the fathers of daughters uh, who have wanted uh, to have their daughters follow them in their footsteps to their formerly all-male colleges or all-male law schools or all-male practices. Um, and one of my delights is meeting the daughters uh, of some of the men attorneys uh, who have now begun to enter the practice of law, clearly supported and encouraged by their fathers and their mothers to do that. Mm. Um, I think we can feel proud of what we have done together. Uh, I think there are still areas that we um, can address to make sure that we really do have the full participation of everyone. Uh, but the changes in attitude uh, to gender and in the successes of women uh, in the last 25 years are quite, quite revolutionary. And it doesn't surprise me if there's sometimes little glitches here and there, but I think we can look back over the past 30 odd years with, with a great sense of pride at what we have achieved. Why do you think women have made such advancements in the legal profession generally and in the judiciary in particular, at least here in Massachusetts? There are many reasons. I think the most important has been the opening up of, uh, of the law schools to women and the breaking down of those barriers. And we are fortunate in Massachusetts that we have so many great law schools. Um, I think that it hardly bears saying that there really is no difference between um, the intellectual capabilities of men and women, and law is quintessentially an intellectual profession. And I think simply raw brain power, intellectual talent carries you a long way as an attorney. There are other talents as well, the talents of advocacy, of judgment, uh, those kinds of things all come into play. Uh, but I think that women uh, uh, went into uh, the law profession primarily because they were interested in intellectual endeavors. And I think that uh, the profession has benefited. I don't want to suggest from that that I think that the medical profession uh, is not an intellectual profession. Uh, but there is something um, that's deeply rooted in, intelli in intellectual discussions uh, th that is specific to the practice of law. So that may well be uh, one of them. I would not underestimate uh, the efforts that were um, made on the part of uh, women lawyers who first established the Massachusetts Association of Women Lawyers and the Women's Bar Association the very important groundbreaking study that was funded by the Massachusetts legislature that permitted um, the gender equality study to be undertaken. Uh, I am a firm believer that if you, if you study a situation in a, in a thorough and fair way and obtain information that you can cause some institutions to change. 
I think all of that contributed a great deal. Um, I think that, uh, that, that the women who entered the profession uh, did so enjoying it a great deal, and part of their pleasure in the profession has shown through again and again and again. That's not a complete answer, but I think that suggests some of them, mm -hmm. some of the reasons. I'm, I'm interested in some of your allusions to the systemic challenges that women have faced in their efforts to become lawyers. Uh, law firms not being open to women, courts early on not being open mm -hmm. to women. Do you have any thoughts on that? Once the formal barriers uh, began to be removed, admission to law schools, um, I think young women today, perhaps when I say young women, I'm talking about women under the age of 20, um, often forget that um, they simply weren't permitted to attend um, law schools. One of my um, great mentors was a woman attorney called Marion Fremont Smith, and she often rankles when people say to her, well, I assume that you graduated from Harvard. She graduated actually in 1948, and Harvard didn't admit women at its law school in 1948. She's very proud of her degree from Boston University, but the presumption that she could have attended uh, Harvard Law School, uh, she is still actively practicing law. Um, so once the systematic barriers were broken, uh, that was an important phase. Uh, and then as the um, challenge to move the numbers up towards 50 percent took on uh, some speed in the late 1970s into the early 80s, that made a difference. Uh, and I've always felt that that has been one of the um, one of the sort of forceful movements of women into the profession. Sooner or later, um, women will occupy all phases of the profession. The, the challenge that I think we haven't dealt with very well is that it is almost without exception that if you are in a major position of leadership, wherever you are, um, it is extremely demanding in terms of commitments of time. And I think we are still working out how women in particular, but men and women, balance what must be primary commitments to family, especially to children. I have no doubt that we will together work out the solutions to that, uh, but I think we're still a little uneasy about them. One way I think that doesn't work is to presume that you have to start off in a career and go non-stop until you finish. I think as a society we have to become much more tolerant of people sidestepping for a while in order to meet their familial responsibilities and then coming back um, you know, with flourish and vigor. I am not here talking about the mommy track, but I am suggesting that uh, ours is a very time-demanding profession. If you are in the middle of the preparation for a major trial or undergoing a major trial, you really cannot do it between the hours of 8.30 and 4.30. Um, and it may be that you have to recognize that while you are a parent of young children in particular, and I'm not talking about two and three year olds, but 10 and 14 and 15 year olds, uh, that you may not be able to practice um, law in the way that you might want to do. On the other hand, we are living for longer and longer, and if people graduate at the age of approximately 25 and keep practicing until they're 75, uh, that's a nice long chunk of time when you can do brilliantly as an attorney and brilliantly as a parent, whether you're a woman or a man. Thank you. Have you seen an influence on the court of having more women on the bench? Uh, people often talk about women having a different voice, bringing a different perspective uh, to their work life. Mm -hmm. And I, as more women go into the profession and onto the bench, have you noticed an influence? I think judges try very hard to put aside personal preferences. Um, and, I, and I believe deeply in the system of judicial independence and of the real attempt that judges make to do that. At the same time, I think that all of us are informed in some way by our life experiences, we bring to our efforts to remove bias and prejudice our histories. 
I grew up in South Africa, and the fact that we did not have an independent judiciary uh, perhaps has instilled in me a greater passion for or appreciation of what it means to have an independent um, judicial branch of government. Um, that doesn't mean to say that I reach a result which is different from some of my colleagues, but it necessarily informs my view about it. I think as we hear many, many different voices, um, our capacity as a society to reach decisions that are just and fair is better served. I would never suggest uh, that there are people, uh, that there are men who don't understand issues that may have a peculiarly compelling impact on women, uh, or that an older judge cannot understand you know, what a 15-year-old is, is going through or appreciating. That, I don't mean to suggest that at all. Uh, but I do think that as you have people from all kinds of backgrounds, it makes a difference. Gender is one, um, race or national origin is another, geographic distribution is a third, religion is a fourth. Uh, all of those, I think, um, contribute collectively in some ill-defined way to making a better judicial branch. Now, if I were to press you mm -hmm. on any general influence of women's voices in this larger picture, uh, would you be able to characterize that? I, I don't know if I could, uh, because I'm trying to think of a particular area of cases, for example. Um, Let's pick a stereotypical one, uh, family law. Uh, with well, it's interesting. Um, I think there have been periods of time when both the Supreme Judicial Court and the United States Supreme Court has paid more attention to issues of family law. One could say in a, in a fairly flippant kind of way, well, look, look what's happened. You have very many more women in the profession. Or you could say, look at what's happening to families in our society. I mean, it's a sort of a cart and a horse. We have um, <clears throat> a notion of families which might be quite different from what might have gone 50 years ago. On the other hand, when I've been writing opinions that involve family law, I'm often deeply impressed um, at decisions that the Supreme Judicial Court reached in the 19th century or the early 20th century that often have the foundation kernels of what's critical to some of the decisions. And so I think you can't categorize one way or the other. Um, I think that's a very difficult uh, thing to do. I do think that one's life experience informs one or helps one understand a context but I don't think that you could say that the presence of women had made a particular substantive difference uh, in one way or the other. <clears throat> on reflecting on your question, I suspect it might also be the case uh, that at a trial court level it may make a greater difference because there you are focusing on not so much the narrow legal question it's rather the whole atmospherics of how to conduct a trial. Uh, I think trial lawyers appearing before Judge Zobel often commented as one of the first women in the federal judiciary that women felt that they were listened to, women advocates, for example, or women witnesses. Whether that was in fact the case or a perception, I don't know. But I think trial judges, there are so many minute-by-minute minute decisions that are discretionary in a trial judge that you simply don't see uh, as an appellate judge. So it may make a greater difference there. But I would hesitate to say that one's gender or one's age uh, or one's national origin makes a difference in that sense. Well, something interesting that you're pointing out, which is, is, has to do with whether the question of whether there is a substantive or actual difference or a perceived impact of, of course. <clears throat> having familiar people in the court, meaning other women. So as a female advocate, you may feel very different coming into a courthouse with women, and that may affect how you act as an advocate. Of course, and if there, are, if there are women court officers and women stenographers and women clerks and women judges and women witnesses, after a while you just all tend to blend into one, and 
people make no assumptions about what's going on based on something like gender. Thank you. What do you see as the biggest challenges for female judges today? I'm not sure that I can think of a particularly big challenge. Um, Given that the bar you were saying earlier, the, the initial broken. barrier. The initial barrier is broken. I think um, as, there, as more women enter the profession, as more women become judges, um, I think that what will begin to fade is perhaps some of the advantages that my generation have where institutions were reaching out to women and women will have to learn uh, to compete not only as disadvantaged uh, citizens, lawyers, judges, not only slightly preferred uh, citizens, lawyers, judges, but as absolutely co-equal, um, bringing to this new um, phase uh, of gender equality all of their talents um, and competing simply on a day-to-day -day basis with neither disadvantage nor advantage. Is there advice you would give to women contemplating becoming a judge? Don't become a judge too early. Um, <clears throat> Massachusetts, as you know, um, has um, life appointments subject to mandatory retirement at age 70. <clears throat> I've seen many women and men who are anxious to become judges, uh, perhaps in their 30s or even early 40s. Um, it's quite an isolating life, and I think of necessity your experiences become more isolated. It's a long time to serve as a judge, and I think all of us have to learn to pace ourselves um, and not to feel uh, so anxious to move ahead. There's plenty of time. One of the um, aspects of working on the Judicial Nominating Committee that I enjoyed was realizing that there were people, primarily men, because at that time that's who had been practicing for that long, in their 60s who, having had a very full career as an attorney, thought that they had something to contribute back and went onto the bench in their late 50s and early 60s. And I think that's an entirely appropriate professional goal. And so I would encourage people to take their time before you uh, decide that you want to become a judge. <clears throat> I know as a trial lawyer, part of the impetus is I can't believe how stupid this judge is. If only I were the judge, I would do it so much better. I'm sure that that's part of the impetus of becoming a judge. And my advice would be take your time gain as much experience as you possibly can. There's plenty of time to be a judge uh, in your 40s or 50s. Mm. And once they've made the decision to be a judge and they've been appointed to be a judge, do you have any advice for that, those women? I think the advice is the same for all judges. First is our commitment to uphold the law. And second, I think it's to work incredibly hard to make sure that uh, as judges, uh, we do a truly outstanding job. Is there anything else you'd care to share with us? Thank you, No, I've very much enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you.